All right. Hello, everyone. This is a special episode that is part of the Founder Series, an original podcast series by Behind the Human and Wisdom Ventures that explores the mental fitness practices, rituals, and sources of wisdom fueling founders who are scaling compassion and wellness. Because when minds thrive, so do innovations, teams, and businesses. We all win. We've got a special treat because we've got Cecily, who is partner, startup operator, and investor at Wisdom Ventures, has been working with startups and their founders to bridge analog and digital experiences for 20 years. She's held roles ranging from general counsel, chief revenue officer, and most recently chief operating officer in the fields of music, publishing, VR, mindfulness, well-being, and crypto. And you wouldn't be listening to this series if it wasn't for Cecily, because this is our brainchild together after a few conversations, basically leading to, we have to do something. And this is that something. Who are you? What a fun question. And I do love it that we're coming into this just raw. Thank you for creating the space for us to have a chat. Um, I often say I'm a mom first. I have two sons. They're 16 and 12. And while I have an incredibly rich life with all kinds of projects and people and undertakings, I did have a personal wake-up call a few years ago and realized that I have this fleeting opportunity to also be a mom of kids who are still in the nest or barely in the nest. So I say mom first. And otherwise, I am just a fellow human being who partially, thanks to good luck, has spent most of my career and life following my interests, following my curiosities, not so much what I should do or what other people thought I should do. And though my career and life trajectory have been quite meandering with time in India, time in corporate law firms, now being a co-founder, helping to build multi-billion dollar crypto companies, there's this common thread of just following intrigue and curiosity and all the while holding a very high standard for the type of people I work with. Mm. I've often joined teams because I was really drawn to the humans running that or building the project as opposed to the substance behind it. And it's just been a real joy. And doing this work with Wisdom Ventures feels like a real culmination of a lot of that. I can actually connect the time in India with the years of the corporate law firm. Uh, oh, yeah. Part. Yeah. Yeah. When, when do you find or when do you feel like you can hear your curiosity and intuition the loudest? Yeah, well, it takes some intention, honestly. I have not always been steady in that ability and I've had to bring myself back at a couple key moments in life. These days, I recognize that it's actually undistracted time, alone time, quiet mm. time. Yeah. When I can really tune in and find that inner voice, that inner calling, that inner guidance. The most obvious example is a walk alone in nature. I often tell people, you know, it's fine to listen to something in your ears or have something going on in the background, but my magic is lyric free music. And yeah. I'm alone, just whether it's in a city needing to take a walk in an urban neighborhood or if I'm fortunate enough to be in nature and be in the woods or by the sea. And I often have referred to those episodes or those, those times as visits to church. I'm not a church going person uh, at all in, in this stage of life. However, there have been many days when I really needed that kind of, I need that guidance. I need that kind of tuning in. I need to know that the universe is, speaking to me and has my back. And if I can get to a place where I'm in nature and I can actually have that time in solitude, I often refer to it as, yeah, I'm going to be at church for a few hours this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did that even when I was in law school, you know, 25 years ago. Um, so yeah. It is the superpower that I see, you know, I've been super fortunate to, to have interviewed now well over 300 people. And you know, there are definitely themes and through lines, but the one that stands out the most, no matter we're, no matter if we're talking to entrepreneurs or award-winning writers, designers, or chefs, or like skateboarders, I mean, there's, there's a whole host of people, but the through line is often finding some way to still their minds. And everyone's different, you know, like, I mean, I think 
pretty much anyone that goes for a walk in nature uh, almost can guarantee uh, a calming of the mind. But there are just there are so many different ways that we can reach that place. And I think it's an, an important that we we find what works for us. And part of the reason I, I asked you that is you've been in careers and you are in a career that if you don't intentionally make that time, it, it can be like you can get swept up into the autopilot pretty quickly. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden there is no stilling of the mind. If, frankly, it's the, it's the complete opposite, right? Mm-hmm. Very much so. In fact, that's something that we we hold as a common thread among us within Wisdom Ventures today. I think it's one reason why we work really well together is that each of us founding partners have some way of honoring that inner quiet mm-hmm. space. We're doing some type of inner work. There's quite a bit of diversity across our methodologies and our daily time commitments or styles of whatever that might be. But we do have this inner attunement that brings a certain level of trust and calm and comfort being very honest yeah. uh, to the way that we work together. So it it breeds harmony. And I've most certainly worked in organizations big and small where you can spend half of your energy in a week just maintaining harmony. <laughs> yes. If you could start with a baseline of individual and collective equanimity and, and harmony, then that leaves a lot of bandwidth to do other creative. Yeah. Uh, it's something we really love to see and we encourage and support in our founders as well. Well, that, I mean, that's a beautiful bridge to the question I wanted to ask you before we, you know, really get into what the series is all about and why, I guess that's the question is, is on your side, like what was it that was, or that is of interest to create a series specifically around founders and well-being and so forth? Like, what was the thing? Because, I mean, th- there's no shortage of projects that you could be involved with and working on. And, and, and same thing on this side, frankly. But both of us, you know, were, I think, pretty lit up when we stumbled upon, like, no. oh, that, that could be pretty impactful. So I'm just, I can share my answer after as well, but I'd love to hear from your perspective, like, like what was that for you? Yeah. Well... When we started with Inventures, we realized that, you know, instead of having this big egoic, we're going to be venture capitalists and we're building this fund and we're going to make all this money and make all these decisions and control outcomes, we had a completely opposite approach, which was we know people who have affluence either by good luck or hard work. And we also, among us, have access to literally thousands of people building upon fantastic ideas to help make the world a better place through the networks of our co-founding partnership team. And so we saw ourselves as uniquely positioned to be a bridge. We can Mm -hmm. sit in the middle, we can attract capital because we've developed relationships and trust from sources. And then we can use our own discernment, our own tools, and our own collective, hopefully, wisdom and good decision-making capacity (laughs) and select the founders that Wisdom Ventures can or should invest in from, we're now well over, I think, 1,400 applicants for 18 investments. So the interest has been enormous. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, and, you know, along the way, we've had this great privilege of honoring the collective of founders we've invested in as a kind of like a a, its own body its own cohort its own interested entity in the long-term durability and impact of wisdom ventures as a fund and hopefully Mm. a fund two and fund three down the road and we have these interactions with founders obviously many don't actually get funding from us because they only so much to go around but of the 18 that we have decided to invest in the journey in getting to know them has been extraordinary. They hop on a Zoom with us. They tell us about why they're pouring their entire life force, sometimes personal money, all of their energy, relationships, whatever they've got into building upon this idea, this product, this vision, this outcome, this offering. And they're fascinating people. Yeah. And we get to hear their stories and we get to hear what it was that motivated them to come up with this solution to this really real problem, which is really what startups are all about. 
recognizing a problem, knowing that there's a good solution possible, and putting everything you've got against building that solution. And in our case, to make the world a better place. And so, you know, we get to know these founders. We have, you know, a handful of meetings, Zooms, follow-ups, diligence. We make a decision. We invest in them. They're excited. They close the round. They're building. They're busy. They're hiring people. They're striking partnerships. They're hustling. They're startup founders in 2022 and 2023. It's no joke. This is real work. It's hard to do. (laughs) Not to mention... In some ways, swimming upstream because they don't have revenue necessarily as their number one priority. They're also trying to have a positive impact on humanity and the planet. And, you know, one thing that we're always looking for in the, as a group is ways to maintain our deepened connection with those human beings. We want them to know that we see them as people and we support their work and their purposefulness and their intentions as much as we want to see their quarterly updates on revenue, traction, engagement, and team. Those yeah. are all fine and good. But we also want we also want to make sure that they're doing all right. They're, yeah. they're getting enough rest. They're spending time with their families. They're having spaciousness to think through strategy. They know how to ask for help. They know who to ask for help. And so while we don't uh, consider ourselves in any way overbearing with our founders, when we have opportunities to nurture touch points with them and give them an opportunity to share a little bit about what they're working with or struggling with or overcoming in a community that might be able to provide support or expand awareness of what they're building, that's a triple yes for us. So Mm. I just feel like there are not enough hours in the month to connect individually with each founder. But if we can provide a platform for them and their teams in some cases to tell a little bit of their story and have an engaging conversation about their area of passion and commitment, um, that's a real gift to them. And frankly, anybody who might be listening to this podcast because there's some special sauce in that passion. And oh, you yeah. get to hear about perseverance and commitment to vision despite temptation. And this is like the juiciness of humanity at, at yeah. its best. You feel it. I mean, it, this is kind of fun because we're we're recording this episode and everyone you'll you'll hear this as kind of the intro to this series. Um, but I've already recorded the the other episodes with the founders, which um, you know, stay tuned over the next few weeks and 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 months they'll be releasing. And I only share that because you can feel that essence and that energy with at least the founders that I've spoken to that it feels right. like, you know, they're authentically supported. Uh, and I think you said it really well, like across, kind of across the whole spectrum. And there is, there is a difference there. You know, I think yeah. when, I mean, it's almost, I'm, I'm thinking of the people that have been on the show that would, would know who are involved. There's obviously you. Uh, and I think people can hear it already in your voice and how you're speaking and what, 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 you know, you prioritize and what matters most to you. Then there's, of course, you know, Diego uh, Perez has been on the show twice. I mean, it, Jack Cornfield has not been on the show, but the, it, and Soren, I mean, these are people that, <laughs> like, Same. if you know anything about their profiles and whatnot, I almost feel, I don't want to project too much, but if I was pitching, thinking of my days when I was running our startup, like even a no from from your group would probably feel not too bad, you know, <laughs> the experience because you're just great people and the energy is there that, um, you know, I imagine you would leave feeling, okay, you know, here's where I need to work a little harder or, or make some changes and so forth. But that's great. For, um, yeah. That's great. And, you know, I, I do want to know, uh, it, it's a two-way reference. Each of those people you named and the rest of the team are literally in awe of our founders. Uh, Mm. They might be a little starstruck, I'll be honest with you, (laughs) seeing back there and, you know, whoever they're they're familiar with and have seen on stages or read their books or or other places where they've been able to to share their heart's work. But um, we're really stunned as a group by what our founders are doing. And it's not easy to do what they're doing. It would be a lot easier to just get a comfortable job and have a secure paycheck and keep the family happy and all the rules. And most of our founders left very secure, 
in many cases, lucrative roles to go out and do something, frankly, quite terrifying, but (laughs) listening to the calling of their heart, their own purpose. And so we're really moved by, by their stories. And, um, I hope that they all know that it, it again, that's kind of, it's a two way road of, ref, of reverence <laughs> between sure. us and our, and our founder cohort for sure. Well, I mean, you're, and you're, you're hitting on a motivation on the, or the motivation, motivation on my side as well, in terms of why this series really struck a chord. Um, I guess you can say I am a founder right now, definitely been in a, a, a kind of a standard, let's say health tech founder situation not too long ago. And and then also just interviewing the founders for this series, you're right. Like they they are doing really important work and are coming at it with a lot of passion. Usually a personal story linked with that, and it's not easy. And on my side, it like whatever whatever I can do to help support the conversation, to help the minds thrive of those people and their teams, then. Like that's the motivation because soon as soon as a mind stops working or a mind's working at fifty percent, like so is the product and the brand and so forth. And and next thing you know, like we we aren't able to benefit from that beautiful innovation that you know sparked uh, as a little seed, right? So for me, that's the objective. And then of course, you know, all of us listening, we're we're all human, going through our own kind of you know stories and situations and circumstances that the ripple effect of learning about some of these practices and like perspective shifts that are possible in literally seconds um, is just beneficial for anyone. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, you never know what story heard by who, where, in what context sparks that decision to, to make a move or to take the lead or ask for the funding or, build the beta or craft a pitch, you know, it, it's, uh, as you know, being a founder yourself, uh, sometimes inspiration comes in unexpected ways. We might be getting slightly ready, slightly ready, slightly ready, slightly ready. And then it's for one conversation or one story or one tale of failure upon failure upon failure before a success that yeah. convinces us. Okay. Okay. Now it's go time. I'm actually yeah, going to do this. this. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. What for you personally, what what are your sources of let's just call it positive mental nutrition? Like what what are your routines or what how do you surround your mind with just good quality nutrition, content, people, like whatever the whatever the case is? I have this mantra that I've been living with lately, uh, which is actually it's the second awareness of a, of a process of uh, an approach to living that I call the eight awarenesses. And um, the number two is, is really with me right now as a mantra. And it is, we choose what we consume. Hmm. And, yeah. you know, at its you know, base level, that is, you know, what we put in our mouths or what we inhale or what we actually biologically consume. But Beyond that, I'm much more interested in all the other ways we consume. What people are we around? What do we listen to? What do we watch? What do we read? What environments do we go into or not? Yeah. I've lately been seeing the energy that I carry through my days and then basically exchange with the people who are closest to me and the projects that I'm working on is really a product of what I allow into my own system. And so one of my practices these days is just being very discerning about what I consume, what I allow into my own kind of sphere of awareness on a daily basis. And that means being really thoughtful, not only about what I do expose myself to, but what I choose to not expose myself to. Yeah, sure. <laughs> There's certain events or gatherings or collectives or community things that happen that, uh, you know, have all of the best of intentions. And I'm sure wonderful, magical things are happening there, but they're just not a fit for where I am right now. Or for example, I've experimented over the last two weeks of not having any meetings before 9am. I'm a 
I'm an early bird girl. So the days that I don't have my kids, I've been known to have meetings starting at 6 or 6.30. And I found that creating negative space and limiting what I consume in those hours between 6 and 9 a.m. to very thoughtfully chosen things I want to read or a sitting practice or just sometimes even listening to music and being quiet is extremely nourishing and helps me mm-hmm. the day feeling very kind of balanced or ready for almost anything. Yeah. And the great returns on that are when things do come up, then self-awareness around the reaction or not watching our own, our own minds start to have a reaction and not do it. I had something happen this morning. I was holding, you know, eight things in my arm going up the steps from our home into my car. And I kind of struggled to open the car door. And as I did, I dropped a water bottle and I dropped an avocado, avocado smashed and the water bottle yeah. rolled under the car. And it was just this moment of, ah. and I watched my mind try to find who I could blame for this. Like who, <laughs> who could I, it, like, <laughs> I'm carrying these Lauren. things. I usually carry wasn't there. And it wasn't there because somebody in my household took it for something, you know. And I was yeah. able to kind of witness that reflexive tendency we have to, you know, kind of become a victim and then find someone else to be mm-hmm. upset with and not just be present in the moment. And, you know, I got everything off the ground and into the car and we're all fine. But that that's a little signal to me that that choice around what I consume, how I spent my morning actually really kind of paid off because yeah. I had the quiet time in the morning um, yeah. and the spaciousness. And anyway, that's one of my favorites right well, now. Yeah, you've been going to mantra. <laughs> <laughs> You're gifted. I mean, this is where we're gifted the pause, right? Like where you can, you can make a different decision or you see kind of where your mind's going. It's interesting, as you were saying that, I wasn't sure where you you were going to go with uh, like the lesson or the, the 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 story, my mind started to go with, well, isn't isn't that an interesting visual of probably how our minds typically feel? Like you physically, we're trying to hold on to a lot of things, but how yeah. often are we doing that internally? And we just can't see it. But then we we essentially have that same reaction where we like drop the internal avocado and it smashes. Yeah, it's a great right? part. I love it. <laughs> Brilliant. So it's, yeah, it, it's interesting. I've recently had a similar, uh, not dropping groceries or avocados, but similar experience with that morning practice. I, for me, I call it like the pre-day. And for the longest time, kind of what you're saying, like just some reading, some quiet time, I'll do some journaling and so forth. But then I found myself, because this is how I wrote the book, was in the pre-day, you know, well, I, then I would do my like kind of regular job. It's the only way I got through to writing the actual book. Uh, that's done. But I started working on this other project in that same yeah. time and started after a couple of weeks just noticing, like, I just don't, like, I feel off. Like, I can feel mm-hmm. like anxiety loops firing. I'm like, what is it? And it was totally that. Like, as yeah. soon as I stopped and think, you know what? It's not worth like the extra productivity to work on this project. Like, I'll just figure out another way to do it and bring back in that, you know, 15 or 20 minutes of, of reading or some journaling and, and whatnot. And surprise, surprise, like within, I think that a day, like, oh, there, there's that mind that yeah. I enjoy a little bit more. <laughs> it's back. It's fantastic. And it's great right? to talk about this. I mean, people, people need to know that that's really important. And, you know, yeah. I, I, we, we, we speak about this sometimes with our founders in the Wisdom Ventures portfolio. We, we try to be fairly open about how important and safe it is to have space for ourselves. Yeah. I spent many years in tech really disregarding that basic fundamental human need. I remember this period when I was I had a personal goal of being home either for breakfast or for dinner on weekdays. And I couldn't <laughs> keep it because I was leaving so early for the office down in the valley and I was coming home after dinner. And I look back now and I shudder because I, I just, the Cecily today would never ever let that happen. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, something had to shift inside of me that made it absolutely peaceful and healthy and normal to mm-hmm. have boundaries with all we juggle and all we carry in a day. 
And yeah. whether it's morning, you know, your reset quiet time or knowing you just cut off at a certain hour and no more meetings after three o'clock or four o'clock or whatever your magic number is, um, that can bring an easefulness. And frankly, I think people work better. I, I worked as oh, a founder sure. once who he was just religious about, I don't get online until 9 a.m. And I'm off at 4.30 every day. He would hop on evenings, maybe for an hour, clean up things, but he never worked on weekends. And he yeah. was running a high growth, extremely successful company. And it, he set them, he set the, the example for the entire org. So over time, yeah. we had hundreds and hundreds of people who didn't work on weekends and kept normal, healthy business hours and were extremely productive and impactful and happy and fulfilled and loyal in that time. Yeah. And it was just being open about it, um, totally. which I love. So I'm glad to hear you talk about this publicly. More people well, need to. Uh, yeah, well, and, the, and I, I think the other thing is, as I get this sometimes, like, thankfully, I'm surrounded by all of these practices and it's very much my work. But like, hey, I'm up and down too. Like, I had to go through a reset. But again, thankfully, I know what, like, the tools, the, the, the kit is there. So it's like, okay, just pull that off the shelf and, and reset. But yeah, just, I mean, I'm biased, of course, because this is the work that I do with teams. But it's it's almost not surprising. Like, of course, you're going to be more productive and come up with better ideas and have clearer thinking if you're not running a 12 or 14 hour high intensity workout for your mind day in, day out and not recovering. Like, it's just logically kind of makes sense. But it's, we're slowly getting there to your point of just being honest. And like, even the two of us talking about this, and of course, the founders to come spoke about this as well. Where like we have the like no high level basketball player is not recovering after the game. Like it just doesn't yeah. work, right? Yeah. But for yeah. some reason in 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 the business world, is we just don't ask those questions that often, right? And it's yeah. just go, go, go and push and push and push. And of, of course, like eventually something's got to give. So yeah. my question, what do you see with whether it's the founders at Wisdom Ventures or just in general, but like where are, because I get it, this is really tough. There's, there's this high pace, fast kind of growth, like just intense environment, let's just say to build any company, frankly. Like that's just the reality of the situation. But then we're talking about these things over here as well that are, I mean, essential for our health and essentially like, essential for long-term sustained performance as well. But how do we like, how do we have the conversation to bridge those things? Where, where do you see the gaps or, or have you found anything, uh, any narratives or anything that's helpful to have conversations like that with founders? I really think the key is normalizing well-being. <laughs> normalizing yeah. what we need to do to take care of ourselves and our families and celebrating workaholism and hardcore boundary breaching less. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I remember in one of my leadership roles at a late stage startup, I would take the red eye to New York almost every other week, once or twice a month. Wow. And I would yeah. literally, I like, yeah, you know, cook the kids dinner, give everybody a bath, get everybody tucked into bed. And then I would get in the shower and get ready for work at nine o'clock at night, put on an outfit, go to the airport, land at JFK, do this little Wonder Woman switch up in the bathroom stall at JFK and be in the New York office by 8.30 a.m. And my team loved it. You're such a savage. It's so <laughs> intense that you do this and you've got kids and it's so awesome. You're such a hardcore working mom. And I just, we were like, I can't stand that that was the example I was setting now. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. you know, four years later in a different leadership role, you know, I was doing the complete opposite. And this is what I really encourage people to do today, especially those in leadership roles and board roles and influential positions where people are watching you for the right model and approach and example. Um, yeah. I remember there was an all executive team plus board email that went out. Hey, we're meeting on March 1st in Dublin for the global strategy offsite that's going to decide the next, you know, eight months of the company, blah, 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 blah. And I was the COO 
And I replied all on the thread and said, March 1st is my youngest son's birthday. I don't mm. miss birthdays anymore. I'm happy wow. to zoom in for part of the day. Let me know how I can be helpful in making the magic happen here. And it sent a little earthquake throughout the company, yeah. for sure, particularly given my role. And the net positive of that went on for months. People came up to me and said, thank you so much for giving me permission to yeah. speak up when something doesn't work. And I think, you know, to answer your question, one way to bridge that gap is just live it and live it loudly. Mm -hmm. You know, make it really normal to not show up when you need to tend to a health issue or break off from your commitments for the day when you have a loved one who needs you or yeah. whatever it is. Like this craziness of just powering through despite what we're experiencing as human beings is toxic and yeah. we need to put a stop to it. So lead from the top. But that's what I love about what, what you shared. It was just, I mean, of course, you know, it's a big step in, in, you know, you had to go through your own level of work to just get to that level of confidence. Just, yeah, I'm going to send that message. But it was a message that had a huge ripple effect. And if I think of the people listening, whether they're founders or leaders or team leads or whatever, I mean, you all have that power as well. And, and we just individually do, right? Yeah. So it's... It doesn't have to be this like grandiose thing. It's just the smallest of micro steps that have a lot of impact. Yeah. A lot of impact. Yeah. And we, you know, in the fund, we do this with our founders too. Like, we'll, we'll find out, oh, I, for example, I was emailing with one of our founders yesterday and we're trying to meet next week. And he said, oh, I'm actually taking a vacation with my family, but I could hop on a Zoom at any point. The right response is <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's yeah. talk the following week. Enjoy your time off. But five, 10 years ago, that was not the norm in the venture world. For sure. And um, so we just try to try to make those you know, make those steps as examples wherever we can. Yeah. We have a couple minutes left. So I want to ask you a final question. You're gonna have to come back on one of these days because this is definitely not enough time for a conversation between the two of us. <laughs> um, my question is all said and done, what makes you smile each day? Being humbled, realizing I'm wrong, <laughs> being called out by my kids. Um, they are the source of, source of truth all the time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I got a, I got a really, really clever 16-year-old, and um, he's as strategic as I taught him to be. So <laughs> I get to live with that. But uh, anyway, I, no, I think really just noticing our missteps and knowing how to have a little bit of a a little bit of a some levity around that because it's really important. Um, I also just have a lot of warmth in my heart when I see growth and change and moving in the right direction. And you know as well as I do, it's hard to do new stuff. I'm doing a few new things myself right now, which are terrifying and way out of my comfort zone. And I have such a tickle in my heart when I get a little universal signal that I'm on the right path. Somebody will just say something like, hey, I really, really needed this and you helped me find it. Or um, that thing that you offered just as an idea was something I ran with and it's actually changed my plan for the next three months or whatever it might be. I, I just love those little affirmations that I'm on the right path and I try to let them in when they happen. Oh, that's beautiful. Beautifully said. Well, thank you for coming on. Thank you for kicking off the series. Thanks for being such a beautiful friend and oh, just yeah. the work that you do and the way you show up in this world. I mean, the ripple effect is just exponential. So thank you for that. Yeah. And thank you so much, Mark, for holding space for our team and for these incredible humans. I know you get to speak with a lot of extraordinary people and the fact that you carved a little bit of life out to... Oh, hold space for the Wisdom Ventures founders and for me it's just super fun and uh, yeah no kidding on the ripple effect thank you for what you do 